whole house of Israel. He's not preaching to the world. He's not preaching to us Gentile nations. He's not preaching to any of us heathen. He's preaching solely and wholly and strictly to the house of Israel. Amen. And that's where his words are directed. That's where his comments are uh, implied. And from that moment on, the twelve apostles become the apostles of Israel. They're going out teaching Israel, uh, all twelve nations. They're teaching them how to believe on the work of the cross of Jesus. How to accept the work that Jesus did for their salvation. Amen. And the twelve never made a distinct difference whether they kept the law or whether they didn't keep it. They just wanted them to hear the work that Jesus did in his ministry and what he was going to do. And he did around eight years later in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. The twelve were going to Israel and Israel alone they preached no, to no one but the Jews and the Jews alone. But the Apostle Paul would be raised up in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. He is going to be a chosen vessel, not by some a religion or some group of people or elected like a, a leader or somebody that would give them advice and wisdom. No, he's going to be chosen and handpicked by the ascended Lord, and Paul is going to be an apostle that is going to take the gospel of grace to us Gentiles. Hallelujah. Us Gentiles is going to hear something different than what the Jews are hearing out of the mouths of the twelve apostles. They're hearing, and it's what uh, Peter becomes famous for. Uh, they have crucified their king. They have crucified their Messiah. They crucified their Savior. They killed him. That's what they did. It was up on the Jews' request that Jesus was uh, crucified, that he was just kicked out. He was not received of whom he was. He was supposed to be the king. He was supposed to be their leader. He was supposed to be their deliverer. But no, they would not receive it. They were living too comfortable in the flesh, in the shadows of what we would know back then as the the Hebrews were living comfortably under Roman rule. Roman, the Romans were in charge back there. Other times, uh, if you remember, Egypt was in charge. That's where Moses led Israel out of as slaves had been slaves for 500 years. It was out of Egypt that Moses led them. Well, here it's the Romans that are oppressing and have in authority and jurisdiction the whole nation of the uh, Jews or Hebrews. And what they did in their rejection of Christ, what they did in killing him, they had to get the permission and they had to get the uh, Gentiles on their side before they could possibly, it wasn't lawful for them to crucify someone. The Jews, according to their law, could not crucify anyone. They could stone them to death for breaking the law, but they really couldn't uh, prove that Christ, Jesus, had broken the law. Therefore, they had to get the help and the assistance of the Gentile people. And the only way they could do that, if you'll read your Bible, it'll tell you that they were putting... Uh, like to the Gentile leaders at that time, the Gentile kings and those that were in charge, they were telling them that Jesus was a troublemaker and that he was trying to take a coup against uh, them 
uh, Romans, and that they was going to cause he was going to cause a war or cause them great problems, and they would be better off just to crucify him and get him out of their way and out of their lives. And so that's what happened. The Gentiles assisted in the crucifixion of Jesus because the uh, Jews could not do it alone. They had to have some help on the outside. The only way they could get that is kind of mislead uh, whom was in charge there watching over that certain area and that certain sect of people. And that's what they did. They got things uh, in what you would call the gossip. They got people to believing and hearing and uh, understanding that Jesus was trying to do what actually Barabbas if you remember, he was the one that was let go, and Jesus took his place on the cross. But anyway, these little things of history, I'm just throwing them in for free, because I want you to understand why and what took place here. It just wasn't that Jesus was uh, born and that he come and they hated him and they killed him, the Jews. No, all of this had to take place in a way uh, that would trickle down perfectly and because there was so many things that it was said about him in prophecy that it would have to be fulfilled and cl completely done exactly the way this prophecy said it would be done. Go back read the book of Psalms. It has a hundred prophecies in it, I guess. But they all had to be fulfilled because David spoke them in the forecoming of the Messiah or the King and what he had to do was fulfill all of these things you know most people have no understanding that this book was entirely and wholly and totally thought up handwritten sealed up by Jesus before he ever made the earth that you're standing on amen before he ever made the galaxies, before he ever made uh, the things that we understand that exist today, it was all written in one book. Just one. It didn't take a whole volume, and it don't, don't take in certain uh, generations of time, which is a 40-year period, uh, that men could rewrite today and rewrite today and and then put that at the back of this book because it's going to happen. No, Christ wrote the book and sealed it with seven seals. And through the past 6,000 years, the first thousand he took a seal off, the second thousand he took a seal off, the third thousand, and as he took a seal off, there would be men born. They would be people arise to power. They would be people arise to the occasions of the things and the moments that in their generation, things would happen that would have to have them to step out of society and arise to the occasion to be a king like David, be a king like Saul, to be a king like Solomon. People would rise to the occasion that like Noah to build the ark. People would arise out of those generations. Every time he pulled a seal off, it was 1,000 years of what we know as time that would be revealed. And it would be men born that was already pre-named Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon. These men would be pre-named and they would not even be born until their generation come about in that seal that the Lord pulled off. Predestinated. I'm telling you, you have got to understand the authority and the power of this book. This book takes us right up to the end time where the church will be called out and where we, as the saints of God, all saved by grace. Hallelujah. Not works, not deeds, not by things that man can do. Not the works and deeds of Moses' law. That dispensation ended with Paul. Paul was one of the men 
that was predestinated in time in the foreknowledge of God at the moment and the purpose in God's time that he wanted this information released, Paul was born. And Paul raised up. And Paul walked in the places where he it was uh, intended and purposed by God to do in the, the authority and in the depthness of Moses' law. And that way when the Lord saved Paul by grace out there in that desert, when he fell flat of his face and was blinded and couldn't see nothing, I imagine scared to death when the Lord spoke to him. I, I imagine uh, absolutely bum-fuzzled and having nobody uh, around that could help him in this situation. But listen, the time of this Bible is predestinated. This book contains just so many days left. There's just a few spaces of time here that have not yet been fulfilled and completed. There's a few people that I think they're born already right now walking around and the Lord just have not spoke to them and put them in the authority of His plan here. You, you just don't understand it, do you? How that this book so was, it was magnificently put together in time. Did you know every name of a person in this book of the Bible? Did you know Jesus wrote them in here before they ever appeared? <laughs> the Lord, there is no one ever like him, and there's no one that can ever can be to compared to like him. Amen. The things that happened, the things that are going to happen, the things that we're just waiting on to be complete, to be fi finished, to fulfill. I assure you, the Lord knowed who I was at the beginning when he put the seals on the book. Amen. I assure you he did. I assure you. He knows you. He knows you by name. Your name was, wasn't something that was drawn out of a hat. He, and if it was, he would have put your name in that hat. You understand me? There's no way that we can leave God out of any little place in this book. Amen. Because he wrote it all. He finished it. He completed it. And now... He's getting ready to just pull the seventh seal off. And when he does that, time as we know it will be over. Hallelujah. The church will be gone. Praise the Lord. Two witnesses will rise. They will be given power to do signs, wonders, and miracles. And the world is going to hate them and despise them just like they did Jesus back when they was in their generation. And I'm telling you, What's going to take place when they kill them two witnesses? God ain't going to have no use for the, any occupants of the world anymore. Amen. Because they will all have all be misled. All of them will be enemies of the cross. You hear me? Enemies. No one else can be saved. Nobody else will be redeemed. Nobody else grace will be applied to. God has done give mankind all of the possible moments of time that he possibly can give them. The book of life will be full and complete. There will not be one empty place in it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We will have all come in predestinated, pre-appointed times and seasons in our generation and we will have completed the Lamb's book of life and we will complete time the time of this this book when time shall be no more Amen It's a reality friend It's coming It's going to happen Don't matter what you do to try to prevent it It don't matter whether you believe me or not 
It's not going to slow the uh, message of this book down. It's going to be complete. It's going to come together in a completeness, and they will. It will be completely finished, fulfilled, brought together by God on the seventh day. The church is with the Lord. One thousand year rest. That Sabbath, that rest that we have, that one day with God, which is a thousand years, we, friend, are going to be at the ultimate most of our, uh, what would I say, what, our thinking, our logic, the, everything about us will have been changed, and now we're prepared to go into an eternity, eternity with God into a place that God has prepared for us because He loved us. Peace and joy. And the only way you can get there is to accept Him through grace and the work of the cross. Hallelujah. His death, what they did to Him, what you understand, what's revealed to you in through the Spirit and through the likeness of God, what He shows you what you feel in sadness of what they done to him. Oh, I assure you, you can feel these things. I assure you that you can think about these things in such a way that your body will almost suffer that pain, torment, that agonizing, the disbelief, the unbelief of the people in Jesus' generation that he looked upon them, he looked them into the eyes, he he could not find anyone that would stand with him. Horrible. I'm telling you, neighbor, there's good things in this book, but it all come about by an awful, agonizing, wicked, painful death of one man. So sad. The world that he created, the creations that he made for himself, they all denied him. They hated him, they despised him, they rejected him, and they were celebrating when he was dead. You understand me? They were celebrating. They were living up. They was having parties. They were having banquets. They enjoyed. They were absolutely thankful and grateful that this man who tormented them just simply by the words that came out of his mouth, that were so straight, so right, that them words pierced them. A sword. It cut them. I'm telling you, friend, you need to wake up and see what day you're living in, what time you're living in. You need to examine yourself to see whether you're doing something that God likes in your life or that God despises in your life. Your life. Are you living it for the Lord? Or are you living it to the form of your flesh. And what you desire. What you want. What you're going to do. Because it's your life. And you're going to rule and reign. And have everything that you want in your life. Because you only live one time. No. You've got that all wrong. You're going to live in eternity somewhere else. Hallelujah. You're going to live in eternity. You better hope that what you have done in your life is pleasing to Jesus. Amen. You better have given and administered forgiveness and mercy and peace and joy. You better have handed out help people that were hungry and needy and that you could just stick a finger in and help in their situations just a little bit. Even if you just give a person a cool cup of water, the scripture says, that you won't be forgotten or left out. Uh, what God wants his people to do is to show love toward his fellow neighbor, his fellow mankind, he wants us to bring forth fruit of love. Fruit of what me and you as far as possibly can do. What we can do in the form of changing their life 
just if it's momentarily for one day. Because we're actually told to take no thought of tomorrow. We're supposed to uh, live our life the, today. And when the sun goes down, we're supposed to have done what we would have done if it had been the last day of our life. Amen. Take no thought of tomorrow. For sufficient unto this day is the evil thereof. Did we get through the evil and the wickedness of this day uh, satisfactory to what God wanted us to do? Have we done every good deed that we could? Have, have we passed over anybody? Did we ignore anybody? Did we push somebody out of our life to get on with our life? Neighbor, this is a thing that only you can examine with yourself and to see whether you've done the things that are pleasing to God or whether you've done it just to get by until the sun comes up in the morning. Another day. Listen, you have got to choose this wonderful gift of salvation. Salvation does not require you to sign a book. Salvation does not require you to give them money and say, give to the Lord, but it's their name and it's in their bank account. No, salvation is a free gift that was paid for, not with money, but the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And what we have to do uh, is figure these things out for ourselves. Uh, not be molded and drug around in this world by a hand uh, like a, a mama or daddy dragging a child that's been rude or weak, wicked or evil, uh, uh, dragging it through a crowd or something. But we have got to place every night now, every day and every sun going down and every night, we will have to have, to have achieved that day what we feel like God put in our life to do. And to some, it may be nothing. But to some, it's going to be something. Because God's always requiring of His children to make a difference in this world. Amen. Do things a little bit different. And you become a new creature in Christ Jesus when uh, the grace of God appears to you also. We have got to take these things at heart. They're just not simply words written on a page in this book. We've got to put it in our heart. And then we've got, we've got to act upon it and let it mold us and let it change our lives. And Paul said we become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And uh, all old things pass away and all things become new. We have got to temper our life to that structure. We've got to allow God a little leniency to mold our lives into what we uh, say that we are to Him, His child. His, he's uh, the one that's ruling and reigning in us. He took us over. We become His temple one day, is what Paul teaches in the book of Corinthians. Paul teaches, Know ye not your body is the temple of God, and that Christ lives within you? Don't you understand these things? You are the temple that God made in His likeness and in His image. You just have to have a different occupant, which is Christ, through the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, living in you. Seek truth. Well, I see that time has come and gone again. and I hope you've enjoyed these things that I've said. I will run you off a copy of this on a CD if you'll call me. All I need is the date, what Sunday it was uh, preached on, uh, what year and everything, and I can run you off a copy or two or three copies. And uh, But anyway, that's the purpose of this radio broadcast. You can go to the Facebook, type in Sister Paula's name, Paula McKenzie. We've got 150 or 60 hours there of preaching and teaching that you can start it and stop it, watch it in the cold or the heat, whatever is convenient for you. Go to my, uh, to the YouTube and type in my name, Bobby Carmen. These same videos will come up. Uh, you'll be able to do the same thing. 
And if you want to send me a love offering or send me a card or a letter, all you got to do is send it to uh, P.O. Box 743, Hardensburg, Kentucky, 40143. My phone number over there is uh, 270-756-6784. Uh, you can call me, I'll talk with you on the phone, or you can ask me a question about the, the scripture, and I'll look it up. If, if I can't tell you right off the top of my head, I'll hang the phone up and uh, look it up and then give you a call back. But we want you to get involved in this book and a Christian life. Till next week, God bless you is my prayer.